This is our first class on many. I want to first review the law of remedies, and then we want to go through several questions that illustrate the different ways in which remedies is tested. Beginning with the uh, review of the law of remedies, um, the two major types of remedies that we are tested on on the bar exam are contract remedies and tort remedies. Now, of course, there are other wrongs besides breach of contract and commission of the tort. But in all the other cases, the remedies for such as violation of a constitutional right, for example, are either are just subparts of the remedies for breach of contract or the remedies for tort. And so if we look at those remedies, we have essentially all the remedies and it's just a question of how to use them for different kinds of wrongs. Uh, let us begin with the remedies for breach of contract. The remedies for breach of contract are The remedies for breach of contract are damages, secondly, restitution, Damages for breach of contract are intended to make the transaction appear economically to the innocent party as though the contract had been formed. Once again, the overall purpose of the remedy for breach of contract is to make it look like it was performed to the innocent person. And so what you really want to do is whatever benefit the innocent person was going to get from the bargain, you want them to get that benefit from the bargain. And that's the purpose. For example, if I was uh, contracted, if I, you and I had contracted, where I am going to uh, sell you my car for $800. But my car is worth $1,000. Then you have, uh, if I went through the transaction, you would have a $200 benefit from that transaction. Therefore, uh, you would... Uh, if I breach the contract, you could sue me for $200 because that represents the benefit of your bargain. The uh, uh, If, on the other hand, my car is worth $1,000 and you are going to buy it for $1,200, uh, and I breach the contract and don't deliver the car to you, then you have no benefit of the bargain because you were about to pay $1,200 for a $1,000 car. And my breach of contract actually did you a favor because you can go out and buy the same car for $1,000. The uh, So the idea of the breach of contract is to make it appear to the non-breaching party from an economic point of view as though the contract has been performed. And um, if you uh, invest to do that, what you do is you give the person the benefit of their bargain. And if they had no benefit in the bargain, you don't give them anything. And there's no damages for the breach. Now, uh, the uh, because of this doctrine of the purpose of a suit for breach of contract is to make it appear 
as though the contract has been performed. Make it appear to the non-reaching party as though the contract has been performed. Uh, because of that doctrine, you can see that there is no, uh, there are no punitive damages for breach of contract. Punitive damages do not contribute to making it appear to the innocent party economically as though the contract was form performed. Punitive damages are to teach somebody a lesson. And the law of contract is not about that. The law of torts may be about that. Crimes may be about, about that. But the law of contract is not about teaching people a lesson. It's about economics, pure economics. The whole purpose underlying, the whole purpose of the law of contract is so that the, that the economy can function because the economy uh, runs on trade. People are trading things with each other. They're trading goods for services or money for goods or whatever they're trading. They're trading things. And if these promises, I'll do X for you if you'll do Y for me, if those promises were not enforceable, you couldn't have a running economy. Uh, but to, to have the running economy, all you want to do from an economic point of view is to make it appear to the innocent party just as though the contract was performed. No punitive damages for breach of contract. Every once in a while you see a problem where there, uh, the concept of punitive damages is somehow connected to a breach of contract. But when that happens, it's because the person who breached the contract did so in a way that it also constituted a tort. Uh, and then you can sue, of course, for that tort. You know, if you and I have a contract and one of us pulls a gun on the other and prevents the other one from performing, well, and even if that constituted a breach, it also constituted a tort. So uh, you see it with insurance companies where if uh, I have a contract with the insurance company where they're going to defend me if I'm involved in a lawsuit and the insurance company is treated as my fiduciary in these situations and so if uh, my fiduciary doesn't do what it's supposed to do for me, well, that's a violation of a fiduciary relationship of their duties and a fiduciary relationship and I can sue them. That's a tort. But the, uh, and I may get punitive damages for that. But what I'm getting at is that there are no punitive damages for breach of contract. If you want punitive damages, you've got to get it from some other kind of claim. If you have a claim, fine. If you don't, you can't get it. Uh, so uh, the remedy when someone has breached the contract, the remedy you want to give them is damages. And the damages are, uh, how do you determine the damages? Well. The damages are determined by, uh, you want to give the person uh, the benefit of the bargain. This benefit of the bargain damages uh, is also referred to as expectancy. People call that expectancy also. I'll write it here. The benefit of your bargain is calculated in the way I told you, uh, and those numbers, uh, the, uh, in order to collect, the, the damages must be actual in amount. Uh, actual means not too speculative. In the case I gave you about my uh, $1,000 car that was selling you for $800, there's nothing speculative about that. So on the other hand, if I was supposed to perform some services for you and uh, uh, I didn't perform the services and now uh, uh, you, uh, you want to collect to get the rest of the services done but you don't have a number for how much it's going to cost to do that, well then it gets to be speculative. So actual means not too speculative, causal means means that the harm was caused by the breach of contract. Actual cause was foreseeable. Now, uh, uh, pardon me. Sorry, I need this part of the board, so I had to erase this. So, foreseeable and 
and unavoidable are the so-called duty to mitigate. determined damages if there was breach of contract. But you know, there are additional rules about damages, and we'll talk about more these more in just a minute. But some of the additional issues that come up with damages, let me suppose I was supposed to deliver widgets to you, and I don't deliver the widgets, and you say, oh, widgets cost uh, an extra $200 above my contract price. So you get the widgets and you sue me for the extra $200. Well, what about the fact that your uh, that in order for you to find somebody else who would sell you widgets at any reasonable price, let's suppose that it took a lot of work to do that. Uh, you had to you know make a lot of uh, phone calls and emails and various other things you had to do to finally locate someone who had them, and then you had to send someone else there to negotiate a new deal with them for the widgets. You already had a deal with me. But now you've got to go through all this stuff again. And it costs you money to do all that stuff again. When you've already done it with me once. So well, those damages are called incidental damages. And so if you're going to collect from me for to make you whole, make it appear to you as though the contract was performed, I need to pay you the incidental damages plus the additional cost of the widgets. So there's another type of damage besides the benefit of the bargain damage here that you can collect, and that other damage is uh, is called incidental damage. So these incidental damages uh, are the ones I just told you about, and to collect these incidental damages, they too must be actual in amount, meaning not too speculative. They must be causal in the but-for sense. They must be foreseeable. And we'll talk more about what these mean in just a minute. And unavoidable, just like before. I'm using unavoidable and duty to mitigate uh, into exchange. It's the same. Duty to mitigate here, same as unavoidable. So we have benefit of the bargain. That's one type of damage. Incidental damages. That's another type of damage. Um, what about... Um, uh, what about reliance damages? Let's talk about reliance damages. Let's put them down here first of all, and let's talk about what they are. Um, let me suppose that you and I uh, form a contract, and um, uh, uh, the uh, let's suppose we have some um, agreement. Let me, let me make a real situation here. Uh, I'm, I'm a musician, and you are a promoter of uh, shows. And you and I have a deal where I'm going to come to town and perform at your theater. Or, and you're going to pay me uh, $10,000 to do that. Uh, and so we have this contract where I'm supposed to come and do that, and you're going to pay me $10,000 to do it. Now, let me suppose that the day before it's time for me to perform, uh, I call you and I breach. I'm not going to be there. So we're not going to breach the contract. What damages are you entitled to? Well, first of all, the profits which you would have made 
if I have performed. So if I had performed, you would determine what your profits would have been, and that's what you want to get from me. Uh, now, uh, those profits, of course, there's some speculation there, because you don't know how many people were going to attend. Well, let's suppose that you were in the business, you do this all the time, and you can make a pretty good estimate of how many people would have attended, and you know what your expenses are, and so you would estimate the number of people you expected to attend, minus your expenses, and you uh, that would be your profit, and you would want to get that profit from me. Now, uh, so let me suppose then that uh, you, let's say you have $5,000 in expenses uh, uh, by for advertising. And let's suppose you have uh, $8,000 in expenses uh, for uh, people you've already hired to be ushers and to do cleanup and so forth. And they are, you have to pay them something because you breached your deal with them. So uh, you are you spent already. You have spent five thousand dollars on newspaper ads, and you spent eight thousand dollars for these other incidental expenses of putting on a show. So you have literally spent thirteen thousand dollars already. And so now uh, I say, well, how much profit were you going to make if I had performed? I say, oh, you were going to make a three thousand dollar profit. I say, fine. Here's your three thousand dollar profit. Well, you can see that's not going to make you whole. I gave you the $3,000 profit that you were going to get through enough, but you're still in the hole because no one paid you the reliance expenses, the $5,000 you spent on newspaper advertising and the $8,000 that you spent for workers and ushers and, and other things that you did to get ready for the concert. So you spent 13000 all I gave you was the $3,000 profit. You can see that you need to get back from me the money that you spent in reliance on expecting me to perform. Those are your reliance damages. And I have to pay you those reliance damages before you even get back to zero. So when I hand you your reliance expenses, the 13000 now you're even. But you don't have the profits you would have made if I had performed. So that's another $3,000. So be careful uh, in looking at these, and be sure to look, look through them carefully. Uh, in the case of reliance damages, the reliance damages also must be actual, causal, foreseeable, unavoidable. That is to say, let me suppose that uh, I am going to come to play at your theater, and we make this contract and so forth, and you're going to pay me $10,000. And you uh, do ordinarily, uh, you know, I'm a musician, I go from town to town and I make deals with these people all the time. And I know roughly how much money a reasonable promoter is going to spend in preparation for me coming to town. Five, ten thousand dollars, whatever, you know, I know about. And so you and I make this deal. Uh, and now, you know what? Instead of you spending five thousand dollars advertising my performance, you spend a million dollars advertising my performance, unknown to me. And now the day before time for me to perform, I call you up and I breach. And you say, oh, gee, Emerson, I want the million dollars that you spent in reliance on expecting me to perform. And my answer to that is, well, those reliance damages may be actual in amount, they're not speculative, you've got the receipts. Causal, but for my breach, that wouldn't have, I'm not sure that would even work. But the foreseeability is the one I'm really after. That is to say, it is not foreseeable by me that you would spend a million dollars promoting my performance. It was foreseeable by me that you spend something like $5,000 or so. That's the range most people spend. And so, if I uh, make a contract with you and you rely on that and you spend 5000 that's what I expect to pay. I do not expect to pay a million. 
Therefore, you would not be able to collect the million dollar reliance damages because that was not foreseeable. Also, those damages must be unavoidable. This something means when you find out that I am going to breach, then you cancel as many of the contracts and things as you can in order to minimize damages, just like the others. So we understand what reliance damages are, the money you spend in reliance on expecting me to perform, incidental damages, the additional cost of covering, actual damages, the difference between the contract price and what, uh, uh, what, what you know, whatever the benefit of your bargain was. Um, now, um, suppose, uh, suppose, getting back to our deal here again, where you hired me for ten thousand dollars, we have a contract for ten thousand for me to come and play in your performance. And just like before, you spent 5000 promoting, and you spent 8000 for other expenses. Okay. But in this case, in addition to all that, you gave me a $5,000 advance. You gave me a $5,000 advance. And now, if I call you on the night before a time for me to perform, and I say I breach, you will want that $5,000 advance back also. Agreed? So you not only you want the five thousand dollar advance you gave me, you want that back, you want the thirteen thousand dollars reliance damages that you spent, and you also want your three thousand dollar profit that you would have made if I had performed. So you want your three thousand dollars let's put these hypothetical numbers on the board. The benefit of your bargain, we are hypothesizing here just to keep the numbers nice. $3,000 you would have made, so you want that back. Incidental damages, you didn't go out and hire another band, so you don't have those expenses in that case. So you have zero incidental damages here. Reliance damages, you spent five and eight, you spent 13000 Reliance damages. And finally, uh, the uh, uh, you gave me five thousand dollars advance, and you want that back, okay? And that is uh, uh, the return here, the restitution. Oops. So here. This is restitution. Um, the that restitution actually goes over here. So you have damages, and you have restitution. And we decided that the restitution was uh, the $5,000 advance you gave me. So we look at all the money that you're entitled. It's 3000 benefit of the bargain, 13000 reliance damages, 5000 restitution. And finally, since this is a breach of contract, you could seek specific performance. And there are elements, things you have to prove in order to get specific performance. What are the things you have to prove to get specific performance? Well, we know about that. The, the mnemonic for that is, um, I put five bucks down. I'm sorry. The mnemonic people use it. I'm doing fine, mom and dad. Said that. Is I, C, F, M, D. I, B, F, M, D, sort of, um, I'm, the, the, what people say is, I'm doing fine, mom and dad. And the I is for inadequate remedy at law. Inadequate remedy at law. D, definite contract terms. 
that is to say, if the equity court is going to make somebody perform the contract, they need to know more exactly what they're supposed to do, so they're in effect supervising it, as opposed to if you're just suing for damages, you can estimate that if you have to. So the the uh, specific performance, you need an inadequate remedy of law, definite contract terms, definite contract terms, inadequate remedy of law, inadequate term, definite contract terms, feasible to enforce, It is generally not feasible to enforce personal services contracts. Ask me to paint your picture, ask me to play music for you, uh, write a book, and uh, I breach the contract. You're not going to get the court to specifically enforce that because it's not feasible. You can't manage it. M, mutuality of obligation. What we mean by mutuality here is simply, if the court is going to make me perform, I contracted with you to convey Blackacre to you, and I breached, and now the court is going to make me deliver Blackacre to you, well, they're going to make you pay for it. And that's what the mutuality means. Whatever they make me do, they're going to compel you to give me back my account of performance. And then finally, the beef is for equitable defenses, the equitable defenses, the defenses to enforce an equity, latches, unclean hands, uh, the, uh, those, those are the big ones, latches and unclean hands. Of course, they're not going to require people, the 13th Amendment is another defense because you don't want courts telling people they have to do work. And that's not, not, you can tell a corporation, you know, an entity, a business entity, they have to do something. But that's different from telling individuals. So if you want to get specific performance, these are the requirements. This is the checklist you go through. Uh, in my hypo, where I was going to play for you for $5,000 and breach the contract, the court is not going to give you specific performance because making me play would not be feasible and also would violate the 13th Amendment under the census. Okay, so let's summarize where we are then. In the case of a breach of contract, there are three types of harms that you would, uh, three uh, components to the remedy for breach of contract. Damages, restitution, specific performance, these three. And so if there's been a breach of contract and you want to know what remedies are available, the remedies for breach of contract here, I'll write the word remedies here. This is remedies. Remedies for breach of contract. So the remedies for breach of contract are three elements. Three damages, restitution, specific performance. These are the three remedies. In the case of damages, there are several types of damages. Benefit of the bargain damages, we know what that's doing. Incidental damages, we know about those. Reliance damages. Um, and each of these must be actual causal, foreseeable, unavoidable. Even the incidental damages must meet this criteria. And for example, let me suppose I contracted to buy widgets from you and uh, you don't deliver the widgets. And because you don't deliver the widgets, I'm going to go buy them someplace else. Now, what you normally expect is that if I have to go buy them someplace else, there's going to be a reasonable amount of incidental expenses. But you know what? My incidental expenses turned out to be a million dollars. You thought they were going to be around a thousand or so. Well, I cannot collect those incidental expenses from you because those were not foreseeable. Okay? So even the incidental damages must be actual, causal, foreseeable, unavoidable. The, um, there is one more type of damage that is not on the board, and those are liquidated damages, and we'll come back to liquidated damages in just a minute. But getting, continuing our walkthrough here, 
uh, where there's breach of contract, the remedies for breach of contract are three. Three kinds of remedies for breach of contract. One type is damages, the other type is restitution, the other type is specific performance. As to the damages, benefit of the bargain, incidental, reliance, restitution. Restitution uh, is a, another damage you can get for breach. If I've given you something uh, in, the expect, in, you know, in the expectancy that you're going to perform the contract, I want that. And so that's what the restitution is about. The restitution, the actual cause of foreseeable unavoidable, does not apply to the restitution. It's just giving back my stuff. And then find a specific performance. Going back to the restitution for the moment, sometimes the restitution is easy. You gave me $5,000 expecting me to perform, and I didn't, and you want your $5,000 back. That's simple restitution. But how about the case where uh, you uh, accidentally painted my house? You thought it was the house next door. And you painted my house, and I watched you do it, and didn't tell you any better. So you painted my house, when it's all finished, you say, please pay. I say, I had no contract with you. Ha, ha, ha. Well, you have delivered benefits to me uh, in the belief that you had a contract, and I knew I was getting these benefits from you, hoping to get them free. Well, the legal system says, Emerson, we're going to present your unjust enrichment. And to prevent my unjust enrichment, uh, I pay you the benefit of services you rendered to me. We call that quasi contract. So the restitution can be quasi contract where we didn't have a contract and I, uh, yet you provided some services to me and the courts will say, Emerson, pay for services rendered. Okay. No profit involved. I'm not going to pay you any profit just going to pay you just what it costs you to render these services to prevent my unjust enrichment. Uh, and that is often called quasi contract. But you see, in both cases, no matter what you call it or how the facts differ a little bit, you see that the main problem here is that you want to prevent people's unjust enrichment. In the case of the $5,000 advance you gave me to come in place, I give it back to you to prevent my unjust enrichment. In the case where you painted my house by mistake, I give it back to you to keep to prevent my unjust enrichment. So that's basically what this section is about. And then finally, specific performance. The only thing left of contract damages is the uh, is the uh, um, is the liquidated damages, and we haven't talked about those. And let's do that now. Uh, liquidated damages would go right here someplace. Liquidated damages. Let's talk about it. First of all, they've got another name. Some people call these liquidated damages. They call them uh, negotiated damages. Either of those terms is just fine. But what do they really mean? Well, here's the situation where you need it, and where it comes up. Um, I am an artist, and I paint, make drawings. You see my drawings, you say, gee, I'm listening these drawings are fantastic. Uh, and you offer to pay me $5,000 for the drawing. And I say, fine, it's a deal. I will deliver them to you in 30 days. $5,000. You pay you pay at that time when I deliver. Now, let me suppose that I change my mind and I breach the contract and I don't deliver the paintings to you. And uh, you, you can't. You, you, maybe you could get specific performance because the paintings are unique, but I don't even have them anymore. Okay? I have sold them to somebody else. So there's no way to get them back. Now you're going to sue me for breach, or maybe I didn't sell them, maybe I burned them and gave them away. Well, if I gave them away, that's different, you might as well get them. The main thing is, I don't have the painting anymore. You just can't get them. Um, the, um, I gave them away to someone, and the person who left the country with the painting, and you just can't get it. So you're not going to get the paintings, 
Of course, you're not going to pay me five thousand dollars. But if you if you could show that these paintings were worth eight thousand dollars, and you were going to buy them for me for five, then you had a three thousand dollar benefit of the bargain, and you should get that three thousand dollars. If you can prove my paintings were worth eight. On the other hand, if I can prove my paintings are really only worth two, and you were paying too much for them to begin with, then you don't have any damage. Forgetting about specific performance, just talking about damage, then you don't have any damage. The problem is that I'm a new artist on the block, so to speak, and you don't. Uh, my paintings do not have a market value. You know, there's they just not enough of them out there, and I'm not famous enough yet. So my paintings do not have a specific market value. And since neither one of us knows what the market value of my paintings are, how are we going to determine the damages for breach? You offered to pay five thousand, but you know, were you getting, were you paying too much or too little? And so we have a problem. What do we do? Well. One of the things we can do is to negotiate the damages right now. That is, we can make a deal with each other that if I breach or if you breach, the breaching party pays the other person a certain amount of money, and we can uh, we can do that. Because if there's a breach later on, we're never going to be able to figure out who owes who because we don't know the market value of my painting, and they don't have a market value because they are they're not famous yet. So since we don't know how to, if there's a breach later on, we will not know how to determine damages. And so what we're going to do is negotiate damages right now. We say, okay, whoever is the breaching party pays the other person three thousand dollars. That might be a reasonable bargain. Breaching party pays three thousand dollars. We could do that. Uh, and so if we do something like that, what we have done. Is to negotiate damages right now in a situation where we realize that if there is a breach later on, we will not be able to, or it will be very difficult or impossible to determine what the damages would be if there's a breach later. So we negotiate them now rather than waiting for that to happen. Those are liquidated damages. Those are called negotiated damages. Now. There's some rules about these liquidated or negotiated damages because you don't want uh, the liquidated damages rule to indirectly allow people to get punitive damages for breach of contract. Remember, punitive damages are not part of the system of the law of contract. It's not. You want to get people to behave better. Go to tort law. Go to criminal law. Don't go to contract law. Okay, contract law is about money. You know, somebody hurt your feelings when they both breached the contract. You don't get that under breach of contract. Go to some other system. Contract law is strictly about money, or the economy, about you know property, uh, trading property. So um, we don't want this uh, allowing people to negotiate damages, liquidated damage. We don't want to, we don't want that to turn into a mechanism. By which people indirectly end up getting punitive damages for the breach of contract, and so we need to put a rule about liquidated damages that says uh, you can't use them that way. And how do we make that rule? The way we do it is we say, here's the deal: the liquidated damages, uh, the negotiated damages, whichever you want to call them, those damages. First of all, this rule, uh, you you allow to do it. Only when you're in this bad situation that I described. Only when you're in the situation where we realize now that if there is a breach later, at that time later when the breach happens, we're not going to be able to figure out what the damages are, or it's going to be very hard or impossible or something like that. So, if this, first of all, these liquidated damages rules, you can, you can, they're enforceable, and liquidated, liquidated damages agreement. Is enforceable only if you're in that situation. So that's the first thing we do to keep from abusing it. Secondly, if you're in that situation, um, the uh, 
the liquidated damages that you do negotiate must be a good faith effort to make your best effort to determine what the real that what you expect the real damages to be at that time. In other words, you've got to be trying to calculate what the real damages would be. And you, so you can't just make up numbers. You can't just set numbers so high that it amounts to punitive damages. It's got to be a good faith attempt to determine real damages. Now, the way that's been tested on the bar, for example, there was a case where, a uh, bar question where, um, I was supposed to repair, uh, to, to uh, build a house for you. And this house I was building for you cost $60,000. That was back when you could build a house for that much money. So I'm supposed to build a house for you and the price was $60,000. Uh, and uh, we had a liquidated damages clause in there that says that uh, if I am late, that's my breach, if I'm late, I will pay you $3,000 per month liquidated damages. Now what's wrong with that liquidated damages clause? A couple of things. Number one, uh, just building a house for you and finishing late does not seem like the kind of situation where uh, we cannot determine the damages when they occur. Because if I finish your house late, what I pay you is the loss of rent on the house or interest on the money that you can't use because it's tied up in your structure. So I pay you that. And anything else, like if you're going to have some... Uh, uh, storage fees or, or extra transportation fees or whatever you're going to have, those are not foreseeable when the contract was formed. So you heed it under Hadley versus back to them. You make me aware of these additional expected expenses. If you make me aware of these additional expected expenses, then they become foreseeable and you may be able to recover them. But if you don't make me aware of them, then you can't recover them. And so if I'm late in finishing the house structure for you, I will pay you the loss of rental value on the house or a uh, simple cleaner case is where I'm building an apartment building for you and it's got six units and I finish a month late, well, you're out of a month's rent. And so that's what I owe you. So we're not in a situation where it's difficult, where we, we believe that if, if I finish late, it'll be difficult or impossible to figure out what your damages are. So you can't even use liquidated damages in that situation because they're the contract liquidated damages clause will not be enforced in that situation. But, uh, so the first thing that's wrong with that, uh, where you're going to pay me, I'm going to pay you $3,000 a month if I finish late, the first thing's wrong is that this is not a situation where a liquidated damages clause would be enforced. Second thing is that the liquidated damages clause, even if it's going to be enforced, has to be a good faith estimate of real damage. Now, in, uh, uh, the, if I'm building a house for you and the house costs $60,000 to build, do you think I can rent that house for $3,000 a month? A cheap $60,000? I mean, the two things are so far out of line that the bar exam is expected you to recognize that. And if I'm building you something in the house that's going to cost $60,000, you can't rent it for $3,000 a month. And so setting that number is not a good faith attempt to estimate the real damages. So those are the two things that are wrong with that liquidated damages clause. One more example, the bar examiners gave a case where uh, I was building, in fact, in one of our problems today, uh, I am adding a room to your house. Uh, I'm adding a room to your house and I'm supposed to finish at a certain time and I finish late. And we have a provision in the contract that says if I finish late, I will pay you $500 per month or any part thereof. So it means if I finish two days late, I pay you $500 for that month. If I finish 29 days late, I pay you $500 for that month. Well, that, you know, since I'm adding a room to your house, you might say this is the kind of situation where a liquidated damages clause ought to be enforceable because uh, how much damage do you really suffer if I finish adding a room to your house or finish it a month late? Well, you, you, there's noise, inconvenience, loss of privacy, dust, you know, that sort of stuff around your house. So how much, how do you reduce that to dollars? 
So you can make a claim, a pretty good claim, that the damages that you would suffer from my late finishing the room that I'm adding to your house, that those damages may uh, not, uh, may, we, we foresee that it would be hard to figure out what those were. And so maybe a liquidated damages clause would be enforced in this situation. At least you can make the argument. Now let's look at what we negotiated. Well, what we negotiated is I'm going to pay you $500 per month or any part thereof that I'm late. And so if I'm paying you $500 for being one day late and $500 for being 29 days late, is that a good faith effort to determine what your real damages are for my late performance? And the bar examiners wanted you to argue, well, maybe it's not. So you understand how these liquidated damages clauses work. You have to, in order for them to be enforceable, you need a situation where liquidated damages clauses will be enforceable. And that takes the situation I told you about, where the parties foresee right now that if there's a breach later on, it will be difficult and impossible to determine damages at that time, so let's negotiate them now. And secondly, the damages that you do negotiate now need to be a good faith effort to determine real damages. And if what you uh, come up with is a number that is intended to promote performance, it's intended to promote performance, that's a penalty, okay, not enforceable. So we understand contract damages. Contract damages um, are benefit of the bargain, incidental, reliance, liquidated damages. The one thing we haven't talked about very much is the foreseeable element. The damages in contract law must be foreseeable when the contract is formed. And I just want to remind you about Hadley versus Baxendale that uh, the only damages you can collect from the breaching party are the damages that that person should have foreseen when the contract was formed. I make a deal with you where uh, I'm going to sell you my car for $10,000 tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Little do you know that the $10,000 I expect to get from you, I'm going directly to the racetrack to put all of it on a horse that I've got a hot tip on. And uh, now uh, you breached the contract so that you don't show up to, to pay me for the car at 8 o'clock Sunday morning or the next day morning, whatever the day is. And then so I don't have the money to go to the racetrack. And indeed, my horse came in and paid 10 to 1, paid $100,000. Okay. So if you had performed your contract, I would have made 100000 So now can I sue you for the 100000 I would have if you had paid, if you had performed? The answer is that uh, that wasn't foreseeable. That loss at the racetrack was not foreseeable by you at the time the contract was formed. And you can't collect your secret damages when there's a breach of contract. The damages that I kept a secret from you when we were forming the contract. So I want to collect damages, uh, a certain kind of damages. Those are called special or consequential damages. And to collect these special or consequential damages, I have to make them foreseeable when the contract was formed. Whereas ordinary damages for breach of contract, the difference in contract price and the market price for cover, that sort of thing, if I don't finish building your house, you hire somebody else to finish, sue me for the extra cost. Okay, those are the or those are the damages which are called the standard measure of damages, or they're also called general damages. They also call the kind of damages you'd ordinarily expect to flow from this type of breach of this type of contract. Those damages, general damages, you don't have to do anything to make those foreseeable because everybody understands if I don't finish building your house, you're going to get somebody else. If I don't deliver the widgets, you're going to get them somewhere else if, uh, and so forth. And so uh, the, and the extra cost is what I bear. Everybody understands that. So those are general damages. But when you get beyond those basic things that I expect you to do if I breach, you get beyond those basic things, they become special damages. And if you want to collect those damages, you have to make them foreseeable when the contract was formed. That's what Hadley versus Baxendale is about. That comes up in one of today's problems. We're going to take our break, and then we're going to outline tort damages. 
in pretty much the same way that we've outlined contract damages, and then we're going to start applying it to problems. Let's take a 10-minute break. Let's come back at uh, uh, 14 minutes. 14 minutes after. 14 after.